Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jeremy Rosen. So like most people here, I work for a company that does uh, embedded Linux development for various customers in various industries. We do mainly business-to-business -business products, a few customer products. Well, we do a few, but that's not our main line of business. And I wanted to talk about our recent experience using systemd in embedded systems in general, and in particular about process monitoring. The idea that you need to look out for processes and that your embedded devices are alone in the field, so they need to look at after themselves, and if they have a problem, nobody's here to help. So we started using systemd, and overall we're pretty happy with it. It's a very good tool for embedded systems. It's around six mega of uh, disk space. Is that a lot? I don't know. Depends really on your products. Some products just don't care because they have uh, nowadays finding less than 500 megs of flash is hard. And when you have less, usually you have much, much less. So you start removing stuff like UDEV because you have no dynamic hardware and really looking into every megabyte. So you enter into all sorts of other problems. Uh, but if you're ready to pay the price, it's really worth it. Um, System D is totally integrated both in Yocto and BuildRoot. The BuildRoot support is rather new but I've tested it recently, it works really well. Just select the new init system and it will just build its stuff. Uh, something that's really nice with uh, systemd is it makes it easy to secure processes. Um, one of the problems with securing processes in Linux is that it's rather complicated. You have to have a very deep understanding of what's going on and what your process want to do what sort of system calls it wants to do, and isolating the process is very long. I don't know if anybody here ever read the capabilities man page. It's hard. I mean, the only one I know that tops the capability man page is probably the namespace main page, <laughs> which is worse. And with systemd, uh, it basically hides everything for you. You just give it a white list of system calls and or a blacklist of system calls, and it will deal with everything under it. Uh, you give it a whitelist of capabilities, a blacklist of capabilities, it will deal with it. It will, um, you give it a list of, of directories that you want read only, and it will bind mount those directories on top of themselves, but only for the process you want. So a given uh, process can just see a, a, an empty home, and another process can only see its own home, and a third process can see everything, and that will work. And it's just a question of telling systemd how you want it configured, and it will do it for you. So it's not magic. You can do all that with shell scripts. It's just hard. It makes it very easy to control resources. Um, again, uh, we control groups have been mentioned earlier today. Uh, control groups are awesome, but they are hard to use because you have to create all sorts of directories and assign tasks to directories and monitor what's going on and understand every parameters. Everything is documented in the kernel documentation uh, directories in your kernel sources. So it takes some time to get it right. And again, systemd, you just have two parameters. I want this one to have that much CPU. I want this one to have that much bandwidth. It will set it for you. Again, just no magic, just make it simple. And what will be mainly what I want to mention is process monitoring. So this idea that uh, when you have an embedded system, you have to make sure it works. Uh, and so when you have your process that crashes because any reason, you have to be ready for it and securing the process by all sorts of um, uh, code reviews and stuff like that does not allow you to not monitor your process. Something will go wrong at some point. So overall, we've been using systemd for uh, a couple of uh, years now, and it's the idea for people who come from the classical Unix world is that it takes some time to understand. You will need to relearn a lot of things, but it's really worth it. I mean, what I usually tell is it's like going from SVN to Git. You have to relearn everything, but you will never come back. 
So the first thing uh, I really like is that you have very fine grain control on how to kill a unit when something goes wrong. So of course you can provide a simple command that's for things like um, that need an external command to be stopped like some demons want that. They ju you can't just kill them or things will go wrong. If, you, if it doesn't obey, you can define precisely what signal to send it first. It will eventually send a sig kill, but first you can usually send it a sig term. A sig term. But some demons, shell in particular, I think, want a sig hang up instead. So you can tell them to do that. You have cleanup, which is integrated into system D. So whenever your, um, your process stops for any reason, because you've stopped it or because it crashed or for any other reason, because the kernel decided it did something illegal, you will have some, a command that will be run that can clean up for you any file that is left behind. It makes it very easy and it's very reliable. It will always be called. You can uh, start a service on, on failure. So service is a generic term for a system day uh, daemon. So basically start something else. You have a very fine grade definition of what is a normal and what is an abnormal stop. So if your command exists with a command code which is non-zero, you can specify that some non-zero return co codes are okay and some are not. You can say that, your, that it is normal for, um, for your application to abort on seg abort, but not on, on segmentation fault, for instance. I don't know what you, why you would do that, but you can. Uh, you have some very, very good definition on, um, on restarts and restart limits. So in embedded system and, well, in server systems, but I'm less from the server world, you usually want to restart stuff when stuff crashes. Because again, our device is alone in the field, there is nobody to look at the logs, there is nobody to check what's going on, so you just have to get it to work. And systemd can give you some very uh, fine-grained uh, controls on how to do that. So rate limits, you can say that it's okay for my application to restart, but if it restarts more, more than five times in two minutes, then we just stop it. Uh, you can say that you want a delay before restart, so if you have to restart the application, you can wait like five, ten seconds, because, I don't know, because the hardware is slow and needs some time to get back on its feet. You can say that some exit status are failures, some uh, exit statuses are normal exits, and some exit status should be restarts. That's all sorts of stuff you can specify. So that's really fine grain, and in particular, it's very useful if you have to monitor a black box application. If you have some proprietary co code that you have to run, uh, we all know how to, it works. It's usually ugly. They have all sorts of quirks that we have to work around, and well, for all the time we've had, we had to use systemd so far, it basically ate everything we throw at it. it. All the special cases we had to deal with, it was somewhere in the systemd documentation, it had already been done, so that's really comfortable. You can say that some applications are really important and if they crash, then you should reboot the system and systemd will, will do that for you uh, reliably. We won't go on all the things you can do at reboot power off with systemd because it's way beyond which I can, what I can do in 10 minutes, but it can be done. Uh, and last and not least for embedded system, it's very good at managing core dumps, uh, not collecting them because that's something that have worked for years, but really the idea of storing them in a given directory, removing the old ones when uh, disk space is growing low, uh, collecting extra informations from uh, slash proc slash PID before the kernel removes all the information of the, on the process. If GDB is around, it can uh, drop the, um, the core dump and keep only uh, trace back which is pretty awesome on an embedded system when, where you're really short on space. All, th all that is just, it's a solved problem. I mean, we, we've been doing scripts, uh, doing that sort of st uh, stuff forever, and now we don't do that anymore, and it works better. Uh, it can handle um, watchdogs for processes, so basically uh, systemd co comes with a library uh, libsystemd, which provide a call to, for a service to um, uh, pass messages to the service manager. 
and one of them is just refresh a watchdog. So systemd PID1 will uh, provide an easy soft watchdog for any application you have, including st stuff like the watchdog doesn't need to be keep dur during the um, startup sequence, and timers on the soft watchdog, which you can um, configure per service. So if a service has a watchdog of five minutes and the other one of ten, or 10 seconds, systemd will uh, deal with that. And just because uh, the chain of trust is very um, important, uh, systemd itself, PID1, is monitored by the hardware watchdog. So uh, if systemd, if, an, if a service crash, systemd will restart it, and if systemd crash, the whole system will restart, and so we're safe. The thing will never stay blocked. So for uh, devices that are not connected or uh, have unreliable software, or who need to be totally autonomous because uh, accessing them is very hard. I mean, we have s things that are deep inside the vehicles or in the, some uh, building ceilings or stuff like that. So basically it's, well, it's not impossible to get to them, but it's pretty expensive. So usually you want to do that, don't want to do that. They have to deal by themselves and this whole chain We've been deploying it for some time now, and it just works. So I think that's a big message I want to pass today. If you have that sort of problem, as far as I'm concerned, it's a solved problem now. Don't reinvent your own stuff, just use what's around. So that was mainly for the stopping and restarting, but, but you have also um, a very fine-grained integration on how service work together. So that's also something we have with a complicated subsystem. So NFS is probably the worst offender, but we also have uh, some, uh, especially when you inherit from a proprietary code where you have multiple um, processes that need to be started in the right order, and if one of them crash, you have to start, stop all of them, remove any temporary files they have left around, and then restart them on the right order. Again, with systemd, once you've learned to use it, it's rather easy to do. So uh, you can tell systemd that multiple services basically work together, and if one of them is stopped for any reason, it will stop all of the others, and then restart them if, if it's told to do so. Uh, it's easy for uh, with systemd to define an initialization phase for a process saying when this happens it means that this first process is done so you can start the, the process that need to be started after so it makes um, a s synchronization easy. Um, it can react to hardware changes, so that's because systemd is coupled to dbus so you can add a dbus tag that tell this particular device need to be monitored by systemd, and systemd will have it in its parameter, if you want. And when the hardware appears or disappear, you can program uh, systemd to start another service. So that's also pretty handy if you want to start something automatically when hardware is plugged. Uh, it becomes just a question of saying that this service depends on this device and it will work for you. It can react to file system changes, so spool directories, that means in particular that you don't need to start cups at the, at the start of your system, it will be started whenever something uh, is in the spool. Uh, it will re react to data on sockets, so that's both uh, replacements for uh, inetd to start uh, network daemons whenever some data arrives, but it's also pretty useful when you have multiple applications that communicate v via local sockets. In particular, it will only start the logging daemon whenever someone tries to log. And last, but Pretty useful from time to time when you have to, um, to interact with complicated uh, proprietary, proprietary uh, software. It can react to someone writing to a file. So some applications are really weird and will write info to files and you're supposed to do shell scripts that will parse regularly the file and look after stuff. You can just react to an in-notify event. So that's more or less what I wanted to say about system D. It's, it's just that we have solved the problem as far as I'm concerned, which is all this monitoring being done reliably and simply. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else has some good or bad um, message about the system, but we personally use it more and more and we will continue to do so. Thank you.
one question regarding the validation phases, because one issue we have with systemd is that by design it's not deterministic, mm -hmm. and it's, it makes sometimes the validation very difficult because you are, you have a system that will works maybe nine times out of ten, which is easy to find and address, but when it's uh, one time out of one million, but you sell ten million of things, it's not very easy to... to Are you thinking in particular in starting order with yeah. the parallelization? Well, first thing, if you have a dependency that would issue an order dependency which is not explicitly in system D, in a way it's a bug. So the first thing is you need to correct it. Uh, and after that, systemd has some pretty good tools to monitor that. If you know about them, you can increase the log level. You can add uh, confirm spawn on your Linux command line, and uh, systemd will uh, basically give you a prompt at the console be before starting any uh, daemon, which can help too. Uh, you have some very good tools in system DNLIs that uh, allow you to have the timing of the start of every daemon and stuff like that. So, yes, it's, it's not deterministic. If you want to make it deterministic, you have to add uh, quite a few uh, after, in particular, dependencies between unit to force an order. Uh, but if you have such a problem, it does have quite a lot of tool to help you debug it. It's just that you need to explore a little to find them and understand how to use them. But they're, they're here. I have to admit I'm very newbie about systemd. Uh, is it possible to um, ask systemd to stop a process that have consumed too much CPU? Like instead of uh, having a process that crashes, just having a process that uses 100% of the CPU for five minutes is not acceptable. So something is wrong into the software, so I should, I should shut it down to protect the others, or maybe to restart the application. Um, okay, so first you have C groups, but C groups are limits. Yeah. I am not sure exactly what C group provides specifically about CPU. I know for memory, you can put a high limit, and if you go over that limit, the kernel will kill your uh, process. I'm not sure about CPUs, you might have something similar. So you can put a high limit and the, the kernel scheduler will basically not give any more CPU time. I think you have a classical um, Unix limit through ulimit, which allows you to do what you asked for. And, I, and if that's the case, it's configurable through a systemd directive. But I'm not sure off the top of my head about that. We're done? Okay, thank you everybody.